People assume that it's a centralized approach um, dominated by an almighty state, mm. but really in um, this, the characterization is political centralization but economic decentralization where you have all these mayors around, you know, innovating and breaking rules and really galvanizing creativity from the ground up. You know, 40 years ago, 70% of the wealth um, belonged to the state. Today, 70% of wealth belongs to the private sector, which is really the main driver of the economy. So that's a key misunderstanding. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David J. Lynch, Global Economics Correspondent here at The Post. Today I'm joined by K.U. Jin, Associate Professor at the London School of Economics and author of the New China Playbook, Beyond Socialism and Capitalism. Professor Jin, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Well, we're, we're delighted to, to have you. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Uh, now, obviously, China and its uh, economic and political rise uh, is not a subject that's gone undiscussed in recent years. So what are you hoping to add to our understanding of China? What do you think has been missing from the conversation? Well, you know, for the longest time, there have been a lot of predictions about China for the, in the last 30 years. And every time uh, we seem to have gotten it wrong. So maybe we have to ask ourselves, is our understanding of how the economic system works actually correct? Is there only really one model of market capitalism in the world that can work? And um, China has demonstrated that it hasn't. But what I would like to add in this book is exactly how it works, including the nuanced mechanisms and the accountability uh, of the government, the competition mechanisms that even if it is not an electoral democracy, uh, it, there are mechanisms in place to keep the government in check. And most um, importantly, to summarize, uh, the political centralization, economic decentralization, where the local mayor mayors play a huge role in reforms, innovation, growth, protecting the environment, is something that's absolutely unique in the world. And with that framework, with that new unique framework, we can understand better how China is in the world, trade, in technology, in uh, innovation, and what its aspirations are in the global economic order. So how well do you think the Biden administration specifically understands China? Uh, and conversely, how well do Chinese leaders understand the United States? No, I think the misunderstanding really runs deep from both sides. And from the U.S. side, I think the understanding is still very limited. Uh, just to give one example, the importance of history and culture is so very prominent and, and important uh, and one of the deep reasons for the deep chasm. Uh, people's preference are, preferences are different. For, for one thing, the tolerance of government is completely different between the two economies. In China, it's expected that the government plays a big role, whereas um, the amount of government interventions could be completely intolerable to some other cultures. But if you just look at some of China's uh, greenfield technologies that have been really globally successful, like the EV companies, the government installed 4 million EV chargers around the world, unlike uh, uh, the US, where there's only 140,000. Um, so that demonstrates that, you know, the people might be different to being receptive to the government's role. And I think the Biden uh, administration has um, a, 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 a group of experts who understand China to a certain extent. And I think there, we underestimate in China that there is uh, a group of very rational uh, players, cold-headed players also in the American administration. And what the Chinese don't really understand is that the U.S.'s sole goal is not just to suppress Chinese growth. Um, but that there could be an improvement in relations, especially if China 
uh, pursues a potentially different methodology in the global world order, plays a more positive role. I think there's room for dialogue. But I think the Chinese um, at some point uh, have thought that this is impossible to improve. And it's very scary that either side would kind of give up hope because that becomes just a virtuous cycle and, and self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so I think the dialogue channels have to be open. Communication has to be open. The U.S. has to recognize that if coexistence is not possible, we're in a very dangerous world. And China has a completely different political system. Its people are different. Uh, the market mechanisms combined with the government, the role of the government will look different. But there's a huge uh, space and scope for further collaboration and competition which is actually a really good thing. We need more competition in the U.S. and in China, not less. And in fact, one of the main reasons that China's innovation is uh, has spearheaded uh, in these last few years is the fierce domestic competition. We're talking about tens of thousands e-commerce uh, companies, uh, thousands of autonomous uh, vehicle companies, hundreds of EV companies, and it's that domestic fierce competition that is driving forward technology and competitive collaboration is really how we ought to th think about U.S.-China economic relationships. Oh. You, you mentioned uh, at the outset that uh, we in the, in, in the U.S. and in the West perhaps more broadly have often gotten China wrong. If you go back almost a quarter century when China was preparing to join the WTO, the expectations uh, among uh, politicians in this country uh, were that that process of free trade and trade integration would lead to a political opening uh, in China as well. The system would become more pluralistic, more quote unquote free. Uh, that obviously hasn't happened. Uh, it seemed to be happening in the early years of, of the 21st century when I lived in China, uh, but certainly under Xi Jinping, if not before, some of those processes have, have reversed. W was the US naive to expect political pluralism to some degree in China? Uh, or is the jury still out on where the system there is headed? Well, I think it's not so surprising that after the Chinese joined the WTO, the Chinese are still Chinese. Uh, and I think this is a common assumption that economic convergence means all kinds of other convergence around the world, and we just don't see that. We do see a lot of superficial globalization where the Chinese young generation uh, have picked up lots of Western cultures and habits and all around the world, but they're deeply tied to the cultural roots. And we're probably going to see that in all other countries as well and going forward. Um, so I think that, but I, I do believe that the kind of disputes over trade, um, especially, is part of the old playbook. This is why my, my book is called The New China Playbook, uh, Where China's Headed. We're often having dated assumptions on China in the West, and um, uh, the old playbook was a lot about industrial subsidies, was a lot about uh, technology transfers. Um, you know, the industrial subsidies have, have kind of phased out. No more talk of manipulation of exchange rates. And actually, the U.S. is the one who is now in, uh, embracing more industrial subsidies uh, with the recent CHIPS Act and Inflation Reduction Act. Um, I think the new playbook is some, about something different. And um, to answer your question about evolution, you're absolutely right. China is evolving all the time. And I think this is actually one of the key things that the West misses as well. Don't read the headline news. Don't read these statements or actions that the government take as something permanent. It's changing all the time. The Chinese party might not change, but policies change all the time. And this is exactly the opposite uh, to the US. And um, even though to the to the West, and indeed it is the case that political reforms have significantly slowed down, there have been political reforms uh, since the joining the WTO, less so in the past few years, but um, society as whole, civil uh, uh, evolution, societal evolution has also changed quite a great deal as well. Um, but you're right. I think uh, the challenge going forward for China is can we actually have more political reform? Because I think, you know, to, to speak about the economy going forward. Lots of people in the West compare China to the Japan in the 1990s, and I simply don't agree with that. There is a huge amount of scope for development in China with the 600 million people that haven't reached middle income uh, by international standards. Service is only accounting for half of GDP compared to 80% uh, in the US or Japan, and the many, many distortions. But what's really important for China to actually realize these economic potential is further political reform. And that is, I think, uh, 
as you rightly pointed, have slowed down? And also, how do you manage an increasingly complex society like China? In the past 40 years, the whole nation was geared around one national goal, which was growth. Today, no longer. Diverse opinions, diverse desires in life, much harder to manage. I, I want to ask you about the innovation uh, part of this as well in terms of economic development. Uh, as you suggested, there's been a, a flowering of, uh, of competition and progress in the, the electric vehicle space and, and elsewhere. Uh, but the innovation record, I think, more broadly is, is a bit mixed. The, the first flight of the uh, long gestating C-919 commercial aircraft, which had been in development seemingly forever, finally occurred uh, a week or so ago. Um, but the engines are, are still made by uh, U.S. and European manufacturers. The Chinese, I think, have, have struggled on, uh, on that front. Uh, and efforts to develop the most advanced semiconductors, despite uh, generous government uh, subsidies, uh, have yet to really bear fruit. So what, what do you see as the link, if any, between the need for greater innovation and the need for political liberalization at the same time? Can, can you have one without the other? Yeah, actually, this is one of the um, what seemed to be an irreconcilable paradox to the Western eye that somehow you have more uh, regulations from the government and there is a perceived notion of anti-business chi in, in China in the last few years. And at the same time, the government is pushing for technology innovation uh, when it is, whilst it is cracking down on its technology companies. This is why we need a much more nuanced view about China. That's why we need to separate the hype from the reality and the macro from the micro. These things can actually coexist. So you've rightly pointed out that some of these traditional technologies in high tech uh, where China has a latent disadvantage, um, ha has taken a long time to catch to the world frontier. But Chinese technologies, especially um, successful in greenfield technologies, especially like renewables. And it's very important to distinguish, you know, application kind of technologies and high tech and groundbreaking technology. So a point that I made in my book is that China can actually master high tech uh, because that takes, you know, accumulation of skills, the STEM students, the engineers, the huge market, all of which China has, but groundbreaking technologies, quite a bit of different thing. And this is where China lacks the US. And I wanna argue that it is part in part because of the civil society. You know, we in China have 5,000 years of, of history, but still an important impatient nation where they've seen quick results and easy wins very fast in the last 40 years but for basic research for these uh, long and uncertain uh, cycles of investment you really need patient capital and patient nation so in, in recent months uh, prominent lawmakers from both parties uh, on capitol hill have advocated a ban on the social media app TikTok, have uh, talked of prohibiting Chinese companies from uh, acquiring U.S. farmland. And the argument in both cases has been, look, there's, there's no such thing as a private Chinese company, that because of the nature of, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party uh, and the presence of uh, party cells in Chinese uh, companies, at the end of the day, uh, the party calls the shots. And so uh, we in the U.S. need to be uh, on guard against this. Are, are the lawmakers who worry about this wrong to do so? Uh, how do you see the party's ultimate control over these private, ostensibly private companies? Well, I don't uh, quite agree with this um, characterization that private companies are not private. Um, but it's true that when you get into a Chinese system where you have to deal with local governments all the time, you know, what do you call that? Uh, the local officials, um, some of them have a stake in your company, but many of them, they don't. But they help the companies coordinate supply chains, attract talent, and then build mini Silicon Valleys all around the country. And they're helping the entrepreneurs. Sometimes they take a stake, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they cash out within a year. It's not these kind of long-term subsidies that really characterize the Chinese uh, model today. Now, that said, it is true that state-owned enterprises often have a minority or indirect stakeholder in some of these companies. 
And if you look at the data, um, a lot of the capital has links to state-owned enterprises, but state-owned enterprises are also run like modern corporations these days. And so I think it is, you're right, that is a very blurred line. This is the kind of, uh, the point that I make in the book, but you know, private companies in the end make their own decisions. Otherwise, they won't be that successful in China. So these companies are some of the most successful companies in the world. Uh, so that, that you know, they, they have these modern organizations. Um, and, you know, one really important statistics is 30 years ago, 30% of the wealth belonged to the private firms, private sector. Today, 70% of the wealth belongs to the private sector, which is also providing 80% of the jobs, 70% of national output, and the majority of innovation. Uh, so where do you draw the line? But if you look at the US, US subsidies to firms are, companies are enormous. Tesla, SpaceX benefits billions, um, Amazon, you know, the list goes on and on, uh, GE. Uh, so, so how do we really draw the line? Right, but not to belabor this, but at, at the end of the day, doesn't the party call the shots? I mean, if, if I'm a Chinese executive running TikTok or XYZ Corp, uh, and, and the party wants me to do something in the interests of, of the nation or the interests of the party, I can't say no. Oh, you're probably right. I'm not sure that uh, this is also not true for some companies in the U.S. or other uh, places as well. I, I'm just not an expert on exactly how this goes. But we're talking about 20 million private companies. There are a few in certain strategic areas, sensitive areas that I'm sure is the case. Um, but, you know, we have to look at the wider scope and you can't penalize every single private company and accuse it of having the state being making the call. I don't think that's really realistically true. OK, let, let's talk about demographics. Uh, there's been an expectation uh, until recently uh, for some time that China inevitably would become the world's largest economy, surpassing uh, the U.S., which has held the the, uh, the mark for some time. Uh, but China's uh, working age population has crested and is now in decline. Uh, much of this can, of course, be traced to the controversial one, one child policy uh, that the, the party uh, promulgated uh, for the past several decades. How much of a, uh, of, of a problem uh, will demographics be for the continued development uh, of the Chinese economy? The country is worried about its aging, but um, I don't think demographics make it to the top three big economic challenges for China. I think there are a few more important others. If demographics didn't explain economic growth on the way up, it's probably going to not explain uh, its way uh, downward. I'm more worried about the huge uh, education skill mismatch of the young. Imagine a young generation, new generation, the hope for China, 25% of the highly educated youth are not employed. Um, and even though they have bachelor's degrees, uh, that is to me the more pressing issue today, not the 0.5% reduction in labor force growth in the future. Um, I think that if the government can't handle uh, this mismatch in expectations for the young, and as well as their families, this can raise social stability issues in a very profound matter uh, in China. Um, but the pension issue, the demographics aging, that the, the pressure that creates is an ongoing problem. But if you look at the new generation, they're many, many more times more productive than their parents' generation because they have a better education. So I personally care more about uh, the labor force productivity rather than the number of people employed in the population. If you look at China's economy, there are 30 million manufacturing uh, jobs yet to be filled by 2025. 300,000 jobs in semiconductors. The list goes on and on. It's just that you can't productively deploy this new generation. That's the most urgent issue. And so what's, you rightly put your finger on this uh, youth unemployment uh, issue, which has uh, been persistent over the last year or so. As you say, 20% of those 16 to 24 uh, are jobless. Uh, that is a big problem. What What's the answer and, and does the government have the right approach uh, to address it? You know, it's interesting because the new generation is radically different from the older generations. This is also a theme of my book, and we need to think about China as how the new generation shapes its contours. The generation that of Foxconn workers that opted for three uh, shifts per night is gone. This is not the new generation. They're highly educated, they're privileged, they're confident. They're not willing 
to work or uh, take up a lot of these occupations. And so for me, this is also a cycle of renewal. It's not a bad thing for China, as some of these jobs are passed down to other countries in, in the neighboring countries. But more specifically, what the government can do is expand service industry. Service industry uh, actually absorbs 30% of college students, or 30% of the service workers are with bachelor's degrees, as opposed to 12% in manufacturing. And this is in healthcare, culture, entertainment, finance, etc. This is the jobs that can be available to the new generation. Also, the blue collar, the vocational training doesn't really have a high standing socially for the Chinese society. But China looks to Germany as a model. China does not look at the US. What it perceives to be a financialized, property oriented knowledge economy is not the model for the Chinese government, but instead the technical industrial power of Germany with their vocational schools is the right model. So the government is also expanding the quantity and quality of vocational training and people, the households, um, have to look at these jobs in a slightly different way. But it is worrying. And I think we also have to accept that, you know, the Chinese new generation is also more relaxed. Uh, they're less hardworking. Again, not a bad thing necessarily for China and the world. Now, in, in the end of the book, you write that the this new generation uh, ultimately is going to push back on, uh, on the government's government knows best uh, approach to, to running the country. What do you think is going to happen when this new generation demands uh, a greater say in, uh, in how things are done, uh, pushes for more self-determination, I think was the, the term you used. What's going to happen when that demand collides with the party's traditional approach? This is an excellent question. I can't say uh, that I know the answer to this question for sure, but I think it's an important development to watch. Um, as many international surveys show, uh, this generation is tolerant, more tolerant, much more open-minded, care much more about social values, and I think they are a bridge uh, between China and the rest of the world. That's the positive force, that their values converge more with the values of the new generation of other parts of the world, much more than the previous generations. But again, this mismatch, this high unemployment, this lack of wanting to be married and have kids because of the present anxiety are some of the real key challenges facing this generation for the Chinese government as well. Um, but it would be also interesting to look at politically what their sense is, because I have to say that the new generation is also observing the West, the Western democracies and how they are, how they are doing. I, I'm afraid to say that they do not find inspiration uh, in that model either. If you look at the international surveys again, uh, ever since 27, uh, the new generation have turned, have made a, 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 a kind of um, a radical change in their view about the party systems and uh, the democracy, electoral democracies in the West. And that sentiment is going to con continually going to evolve uh, along with you know, U.S.-China relations, geopolitics, and of course how democracies do all around the world. So it's it's not clear that they desire something completely and radically different for China. But what we can hope for is there has been political reform in the past, and there still might be more political reform in the future with a new generation of leaders. Yeah, but Xi Jinping doesn't doesn't seem to have much of an agenda for political reform. But what sort of thinking do you think is going on below his level, perhaps in in uh, the Central Party School or, or uh, Chinese think tanks? And and what's what would be a conceivable evolution of the Chinese political system? Because I take your point that. Uh, many Chinese have no interest in, in the American model, um, but they've been thinking for a long time, I think, at least in the U.S., that China might perhaps someday follow the East Asian model, the sort of liberalization that you ultimately saw in South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, admittedly smaller polities, but a, a changing, more pluralistic environment. What, when you look 10, 20 years into the future, what, what do you think is conceivable for China? This is a extremely hard question, I have to admit. Um, part of the reason is I'm not an expert, that I haven't delved deeply into these political reform issues. Um, but first of all, let me just talk about the short term. I think let's not underestimate, despite the headline news and all these grandiose rhetoric, et cetera, that economic pragmatism pragmatism has returned, is going to take hold for the next three to five years, because China's economy is, is in a completely deplorable situation. There is some kind of rebound, 
but just not at all as people expect, and it's probably going to be worse next year. And this has a lot of implications on a number of issues. First, um, you will hear a lot about security concerns, but mind you, the security department, economics department are two separate departments in China, somewhat to a certain degree in the US as well. They don't coordinate with each other. Once they are really encountering each other, um, countering each other in major ways, then the top leadership will come out to coordinate. So watch out for economic pragmatism returning, meaning that China is going to try to balance out um, uh, these issues, improve relations with the West, especially with Europe to the extent it can, um, and really uh, embrace that local dynamism that we talked about on the ground. Uh, I think that will still take priority uh, in the next few years. Really, in the long term, you know, China has this incredibly strong Mech, uh, uh, apparatus, the political economic apparatus that has evolved a great deal, but the foundation is very similar to what it was, you know, even a thousand years ago. There was economic decentralization uh, that long ago, and I just don't see that kind of centralized political approach really changing much. China is a very large country compared to South Korea or you know, the likes of Singapore as an example, I'm not sure people are convinced even inside China that a full scale liberalization um, is really feasible. I just don't see radical changes to the political system in the next 20 years unless something radical happens to the economy. Um, and I think, despite what people predict, the economy will muddle through. If they manage to put uh, push through these more reforms, like the financial system, for example, and having 600 million people becoming middle class, then the political system is more uh, stable than uh, ever. If there's something radical happening, then you know it's an open-ended question. And, and you mentioned the economic problems, and, and certainly China has, has a long list uh, been trying to make a, a transformation from the export dependent manufacture, manufacturing uh, heavy system to something more oriented toward uh, domestic consumption. That's had sort of fitful, fitful progress, but not complete uh, success yet. How great is the danger that China ends up as many other developing countries have over time, stuck in what the World Bank has called the middle income trap, where you advance to a certain level, uh, about where China is today, but never quite make the full leap to the level of uh, Japan, Europe, the United States. Well, that is indeed um, a, a key risk. Um, but if you look at um, you know some serious studies about how to avoid the middle income trap, two things are very important. One is infrastructure. Uh, this could be physical infrastructure, but I would actually expand that to include digital infrastructure for the modern age. And the second is human capital. Um, lots of countries get into the middle income clap because they can't um, have, they don't have sufficient uh, measures in both. Uh, China is not the case. Um, there, there is both human capital is improving uh, a bit. Too, you know, a fat, the, the diplomas have raced ahead of the economy, as we've seen uh, with the youth uh, education problems. Um, I really think that. Uh, uh, with and with China's innovation, really, the kind of um, uh, um, whether it's applications or the high tech that we have discussed, the the this, the kind of the way to escape the middle income trap is really there, but. What these studies do not take into account, the rising geopolitical uncertainties and macro uncertainties, this is really the first time that a large developing country has encountered such uh, external constraints. So that might be um, a key thing to watch. But just let me say, look, you know, the U.S. shock to China, OK, this U U.S. Uh, technology uh, investment restrictions is now becoming a new normal. The Chinese have accepted that. And how many more things can they really fight about? At some point, you know, we, we talk about balloons and then the, the list seems to be endless, but they're not. Uh, at some point, it's just going to become a new normal. And uh, I, uh, my prediction is that um, they will stabilize the relationships because the U.S. also does not want to have confrontation with China. And China will focus on its economy, but also developing a parallel technology system. And don't underestimate China's huge domestic innovation ecosystem. 
it's so important to have these um, uh, downstream players like the autonomous vehicle, EV, that the clients be very close to upstream players like semiconductors. And that um, a loop, closed link loop, this huge demand, the proximity, the industrial supply chain is very, very critical for technological development. Just as we look at Japan, where the semiconductors rise was very much because of the rise of electronics uh, assist, uh, industry in Japan as well. And Japan is a closed economy. Now, China doesn't want that. To be very, very clear, China is open for business in the rest to the rest of the world, uh, embraces globalization. And by the way, half of China's export is in supply chain exports, okay, input trade. So imagine having China not participate as much in the global supply chain because of geopolitics. It would be absolutely disastrous to the whole world's economy. Well, Professor, I, I've uh, only got another 30 or 40 questions for you, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we, we are out of time. So I have to thank you for uh, joining us today. It's been a great conversation. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining as well. Uh, if you'd like to see what other interviews we have on tap, head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm David J. Lynch, Global Economics Correspondent here at The Post. Thanks again for watching.